thanks a lot, David, for that very kind introduction and, and, and making me feel old. <laughs> I think it's just about the way we sent it to you. You probably had lived a little bit, but uh, it, it's great to be with you today. I think we're going to queue up our slides. Uh, and, and really, it's exciting to be in a room full of manufacturers because I think you know uh, you're not only the backbone of the Rocky Mountain economy, but you're critical to uh, North Carolina's economy. And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, I had a chance to visit uh, before dinner with uh, Teresa Pinto. I mean, you have a great uh, chamber exec running this organization, if you don't know it. Uh, she's kind of lacking for enthusiasm. We probably got to work on her uh, in that area. But uh, she's doing great things here. And uh, you're lucky to have her. And uh, we're lucky to have her in North Carolina. Well, it's a real pleasure to be with you here for Manufacturing Day. As you know, last week, uh, and in, in my opinion, this is sort of a continuation of Manufacturing Day. Uh, but last, last week was National Manufacturing Day uh, all across America. And uh, I think it, it served to highlight uh, the important role that manufacturers are playing across America. And I was pleased to see uh, you all participating in a big way today. Uh, Teresa told me about your full day of activities. Uh, really excited to hear that you had students coming to spend time with you, talking to manufacturers, talking to you about what you really do. Uh, that, that, that's how we're winning the hearts and minds and getting kids interested in working in manufacturing. Uh, a friend of mine that runs the State Community College, Scott Rawls, refers to this challenge as the interest gap. Uh, the interest gap between uh, kids thinking about what they want to do for the future and not always gravitating toward making things. And uh, I think they're seeing, hopefully today, firsthand what kind of cool things are happening uh, here in Rocky Mount. Uh, but the kind of exposure Manufacturing Day gave to all, all manufacturers across the state and the country last week uh, is really important. You can go to the next slide. Just a quick snapshot on who we are in terms of our footprint. Uh, I think as you can see from the introduction, uh, the, the kind of collective clout that we bring to issues that affect business is growing. And I think it's growing directly in proportion to the opportunity and the challenges uh, that businesses are facing at the state level. Uh, currently, we're the largest broad-based business organization uh, representing businesses at the state capitol in Raleigh. Uh, all we think about every day is advocacy for business and political action. 100% uh, of our effort, our money, and our budget, all we think about every day is how do we make North Carolina the best state for business, and in our opinion, also the best state for manufacturing. <clears throat> you can see the footprint of our members and who they employ. It's about a third of the total private sector workforce. Uh, we operate on a budget that's 100% funded by business. We think that puts us in the best position to advocate for business. Because when we're talking to legislators about the change they have to make to allow you to be more competitive and compete, uh, we receive zero dollars, zero dollars from government. We work closely with our colleagues at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as David alluded to, on national issues when we want to get Congress moving. Uh, we go visit them. Uh, I'd like to tell you that's a productive adventure, but uh, I'd be kidding you. Uh, as Betty Jo knows, uh, not a lot happens these days in D.C. Uh, and what's exciting, though, when I'm with my colleagues around the country, increasingly across America, the action is gravitating away from D.C. and gravitating toward the states and toward the state capitals. And, and I'm excited to talk to you tonight about big things that are happening in our state capital uh, that affect business, your business, in a big way. We also work with our colleagues at the National Association of Manufacturers, and as David alluded to, we're the NAM affiliate here in North Carolina, so we're also the State Manufacturers Association. Got you. So just briefly, and, and uh, I'll, I'll leave these slides with Teresa so you don't have to write all this stuff down, but just to kind of level set the impact that manufacturing has on the U.S. economy, uh, kind of wish we had press here tonight, too, because I, I think what happens is the media tends to get this all wrong. Uh, they, they want to paint a picture that manufacturing was 50 years ago, thousands of jobs are gone, all those jobs are overseas, and they're not coming back. You know, part of that's right. Uh, but here's the part they miss. Manufacturing today employs over 11 million workers nationally. An annual payroll of over 600 billion with a B dollars. Manufacturers contribute over $2 trillion to the economy and this figure has been on the rise since 2009. For every dollar spent in manufacturing, $1.37 is added to the economy. So you talk about the kind of jobs any economy wants to create, creating manufacturing jobs make the single biggest difference of any job you can create. Taken alone, manufacturing in America would be the ninth largest economy in the world. 
And the other interesting factoid that you probably know is all this talk about China and India and who's the most productive workers. The most productive workers in the world are still right here in America. They're right here in Rocky Mount. We're competing, it's not even close. When you look at the productivity output of American workers in manufacturing compared to workers abroad. So part of this gives North Carolina a real competitive advantage and we're trying to leverage that going forward. So let's bring it home, because in our opinion, uh, how, do, how do we stack up here in North Carolina? And in our opinion, what North Carolina makes, makes North Carolina, and it's always been that way. Uh, we're currently first in the southeast in terms of a manufacturing economy. This is the fourth largest manufacturing economy in the country. Economic output has surpassed $98 billion in 2012 and accounted for over 20% of state uh, GDP. It's by far and away the largest employer in the state. Uh, 450,000 North Carolinians account for over 10% of the total workforce. Uh, one in 10 people in our state work in manufacturing. But, but here's the good piece of this news. People talk about we need to create more high paying jobs, uh, grow the middle class. That's happening in manufacturing. Manufacturing jobs pay on average $22,000 greater than non-manufacturing jobs. No other sector of the economy creates more economic value and a better multiplier effect uh, in the region. So let's talk about some of the things that we think from our standpoint make North Carolina a leading place for manufacturing. And I want to share with you some important changes that we've, we've recently made to make it even better. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you have to know that as a right to work state, being a non-union state is important uh, in North Carolina, it's important in America. This is and has been over a long period of time the least unionized state in America. About 3% of our total, total workforce is unionized. So when companies are looking at where opportunity is greatest, when foreign companies are looking at where to put dollars, this isn't the first question they ask, but it's about one or two or three. Uh, it's a critical part of why North Carolina's manufacturing economy we think is moving forward. Uh, energy. Energy is a big part of the equation and a couple projects you know that are on the drawing board we think can make this even bigger. Uh, we know there's frack natural gas opportunities in a few counties uh, in central North Carolina. Uh, we know that over time there's offshore drilling opportunities that, that some say off the coast of our state is some of the richest deposits of natural gas off, off the, inter, off the uh, continental shelf. That, that may be a decade or two till we get it, but there's real energy uh, in and around North Carolina. Uh, I think the other uh, big thing coming our way is uh, Dominion and Duke, as you know, have made a $5 billion uh, commitment to invest in a pipeline that will bring frack, frack natural gas out of West Virginia, through Virginia, and through this part of the state. I don't have to tell you what a game changer that is, but let me tell you this. It's been since the 50s that North Carolina has built any new natural gas pipelines. Uh, so we're behind the times on that. We're behind the times for manufacturers. Uh, we can't get that low cost efficient natural gas quick enough uh, to this part of the state. But it'll be a game changer. It'll be a game changer for manufacturers. Not only will it benefit from the use of that uh, low cost energy, uh, also electric producers that produce natural gas, uh, electricity from natural gas. Uh, but more importantly, there's whole industries that crop up around uh, turning natural gas into other products. Again, the whole petrochemical uh, opportunity could be a big deal as we bring that pipeline into this region. I don't have to tell you with electric cities in Duke uh, coming to some kind of agreement on energy, uh, Rocky Mount is better positioned to have energy costs that look like the rest of the state. Uh, I know you know that's a game changer, but when we look at energy in general, North Carolina's energy costs are among the lowest in the country, and again, position manufacturers to be successful. We've also made big improvements this year at the session, uh, and not all of this has hit the newspapers, on major issues that affect your ability to compete, not only in this country, but with your competitors overseas or your peer plants uh, in other states and in other countries. We've made major progress in the area of tax and tax reform. Uh, in 2013, when tax reform started in North Carolina, we had the 44th worst climate for business. 
Uh, some of the changes I'll talk about have moved us to 16th. Uh, I don't have to tell you that, that there's no incentive in the world, none, no incentive in the world that can turn the 44th worst business climate in America into something that's positive. We've made big changes in corporate tax. We've made big changes in personal tax. Uh, the corporate rate's gone from 6.9 eventually to 3 by 2017. Uh, the personal income tax rate was at a high of 8 percent. It's now under 5.5 percent. Uh, you know, these aren't zero tax rates like Texas and Florida. They don't have to be. But they're no longer out of line with competitor states in the southeast. North Carolina can and is competing on tax. Uh, and it's critical for the kind of companies that you represent. Another big game changer came out of this uh, session is this whole uh, notion of single sales factor apportionment. Uh, we have been disadvantaging companies for decades uh, that are headquartered and manufacturer. Uh, every state around us uh, in the southeast has a single sales factor for tax apportionment, and now North Carolina does too. Uh, you talk about a competitive advantage and that will open the doors for more companies coming to our state, more headquarters coming to our state. Uh, we're now competing in the southeast with a tax advantage that can make a difference. Uh, there's a number of other tax changes, uh, too numerous to mention, but say nothing of the fact that when, when North Carolina is paying attention to how we compete, uh, tax and tax rates matter. We've also paid attention to another huge impediment, and one that you as manufacturers told us nine years ago, this one's absolutely killing your business. We've tackled head-on the state's workers' compensation system. Uh, for those of you that work on safety in your plant, which is almost all of you, because uh, I've been to some of your plants, uh, North Carolina is one of the safest places in America to work. But prior to workers' comp reform, we had the highest cost per claim. We were a lifetime benefit state. So if you're an injured worker at age 40 that goes out, uh, you're never coming back to work. The personal injury attorney that they're going to hire is going to make sure you don't. Uh, that, that's not what workers' comp is supposed to do. Uh, we've now capped those benefits at 500 weeks. Injured workers are getting the help they need to get back to work. And plaintiff's lawyers are finding it very difficult to make a living suing you for workers' comp. Uh, we think that's a good thing. Uh, but, but again, we're, we're taking some of the real impediments to job creation and we're fixing them. We've taken dead aim at the regulatory environment. Uh, regulations, you told us, were absolutely killing manufacturing in North Carolina. Uh, on the surface, we said, we're open for business. We want more manufacturers in the state. And then as you started doing business, you came to realize this is a really tough place to do business. There's a lot of red tape. There's a lot of redundant regulations. We're one of the few states in America that had a separate state environmental protection agency and, a, and along with EPA. Uh, we got rid of that. Uh, now we just have EPA rules. But let me tell you a story that I think brings that point home. The second week on the job, our governor, uh, Governor McCrory, tells a story. He had the CEO of Ashley Furniture come to visit him from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, for two years, they were trying to build a, a furniture plant in Davie County uh, in central North Carolina. Uh, Davie County had 14 percent unemployment, and, da and uh, Ashley Furniture was trying to put a thousand people to work making furniture. We're ready to go. But the CEO had to tell the new governor, Governor McCrory, uh, it's taken us two years, two years, to take an abandoned Reynolds plant, open it up, and put a thousand people to work. But then he went on to say, he said, you know, it's easier to do business in California than it is in North Carolina. You talk about sending a message. Uh, the governor heard that message. The legislature heard that message. And, and, and you know that to be true. Uh, that's why we've taken dead aim and on regulations, because we can't be the best state for business if we're not the best state for manufacturing. And we won't be the best state for manufacturing if we put red tape in the way of you doing what you need to do. The next thing we did is we looked at the state's unemployment insurance system. Uh, this is money you pay into the system to pay for unemployed workers when they collect unemployment. Prior to reform, we had the worst run unemployment system in America. And why you should care about that is uh, this is a system in Raleigh that's managing your money. The only source of unemployment benefits come from folks like you who pay taxes into the unemployment system. We had overdrawn that account by two and a half billion B billion dollars and we owed the federal government a lot of money, the fourth most in America. There was no plan to pay it back. 
So we had to come up with uh, legislation that was tough medicine. We had to increase benefits or uh, increase taxes on employers. So all of you have seen a surcharge uh, to help pay that debt down. We had to cut the weekly benefits down from 99 weeks to 20. That was tough. Uh, but one of the things that employers have thanked us most for when I travel the state is thank you for trimming back the benefits because we now have people that want to come to work. Uh, if, if you got 50 or 60 more weeks of benefits and I got a job for you, I, I can't hire you uh, because 99 weeks of benefits kept a lot of people at home when you have jobs. Every manufacturer in North Carolina has people they need to put to work right now. So the unemployment system has gone from worst to first. We now have one of the best run unemployment systems in America. And again, this is your money. This is the bank of your unemployment dollars that are being better attended to uh, in Raleigh. We've made big progress in the legal climate. Uh, you that make things understand that you get sued. Uh, North Carolina is a very litigious environment and very tough on business. We've made big changes to the legal climate. We've gone from 20th, middle of the pack, to 7th. This is now the leading uh, pro-business legal climate uh, in America, uh, the best in the Southeast. So again, all things combined, the kind of things that, co that contribute to the cost of doing business, we've made important strides. And finally, in the area of education, uh, this I think is our secret weapon, but we have to get better at it. Uh, the skills gap that you tell us you have, and it, it exists everywhere I visit, uh, is real. Uh, the interest gap that I alluded to at the outset is a challenge getting people to think about manufacturing as a career. We spent a lot of time at the state level uh, providing dual emphasis, not only on higher education, four-year degrees, but, but about a third of the jobs, maybe almost half the jobs that are going to be opening now and in the future don't require a four-year degree. They require technical skills, certificates, uh, certified background that you can put these folks to work. And that's what you're telling us we can't find. So we're getting a little more aggressive, trying to close that skills gap and put the workers you need at your front door with the skills you have to have. Uh, okay. So let's look at, how, look at how some of these pro-growth strategies are working. And, and it's exciting. I mean, I think the North Carolina economy is on fast forward. And I think when you look at uh, the, the turn of the century and some of the challenges we faced, uh, there's some real positive momentum going forward. We talked about the tax changes and how that positions us. But what it means for you is there's more money back uh, in your business. There's more money you can invest in your company, uh, more money you can use to create jobs and invest in technology. Uh, changes in the legal climate, every bit as important uh, to the business climate. But look at the job creation. We've had three years in a row, and, and this year will be another one, of 70,000 plus new jobs. That hasn't happened in North Carolina since the 90s. It certainly hasn't happened since the turn of the century. But here's one that most people are surprised by because there's a lot of talk these days that, you know, we simply can't grow jobs and create jobs unless we have incentives. And you know, that, that's not wrong, but, but take a look at this. 86% of all the new jobs being created right now in North Carolina are coming from companies just like yours that live here. And from our standpoint, you're the only folks that we interact with. Uh, we love to see new companies come to our state, don't get me wrong, uh, but, but the job creators already live here, and a bulk of them are being created by the companies right now that call North Carolina home. The, the final area that we think is a real game changer is what's going on, as David alluded to, with transportation and infrastructure. Not, not since the 80s has North Carolina made a more significant investment in growing infrastructure and investing in our future. North Carolina, based on our statistics, will add 3 million more people uh, by 2030. Uh, areas like this will grow. Uh, uh, roads and bridges, uh, about a third of our bridges are structurally unsound. Uh, in fact, you might have seen in, in Yakinville uh, about a month ago, there was a bridge collapse uh, near an elementary school a, a week before school opened. So if, if you think we haven't been paying attention to infrastructure, you're probably right. It's been too long. And I know Gus has been working with the DOT board for a long time, and he knows that too. But the exciting thing is now, uh, this budget that just passed is over a billion dollars over a two-year period in recurring, recurring annual money that we can invest in infrastructure, roads, bridges, the ports. It's a game changer for North Carolina. It's a game changer for manufacturers. It'll fuel manufacturing distribution. It'll improve supply chains. 
and basically make the kind of investments serious states like North Carolina have to make if they're serious about growing their economy. Now, Betty Joe, that doesn't mean we're not counting on Washington to bring us some more road money, and we know you guys are working hard on that. But states like North Carolina are taking care of business because we have to. Uh, we have to make these kind of investments, and the good news is we are and we just did. And, uh, but those are the kind of things that happen uh, when the economy is growing. And folks are noticing. So the recognition North Carolina is getting on the national stage uh, continues to improve. Uh, how we're stacking up on in-migration, how we're stacking up from CNBC in terms of st top states for business. Uh, we're a competitive state. We're a cost-efficient state for manufacturing. Uh, we have low uh, state and local tax burdens, according to Ernst & Young. But, but national organizations are paying attention to what you now know. The changes we're making in North Carolina are starting to work. So let's talk briefly about where we're going. And uh, for us, that means where we're we going by 2030. Uh, about three years ago, uh, some of the most important leaders in this state got together and said, you know, uh, North Carolina needs to have a long-term vision and a long-term plan uh, to grow the economy and move this state forward. A and one that thinks bigger, broader, it thinks about the future, uh, it thinks beyond election cycles, and thinks more about business cycles, and, and make the kind of big investments we have to make in our state. Uh, as I mentioned, our state is growing. Uh, by 2030, we'll be the seventh largest state in America. Uh, North Carolina, in, in order to accommodate that growth, needs to create a million, a million new jobs. What's exciting about all that is we're moving at that pace. Right now, North Carolina is moving at the million new job pace. But for us, as a business community, it means we have to find a way for, at times, policy has to trump politics. So we need to help our leaders in Raleigh do the right thing, uh, even though it's not the right political thing. Uh, it also means business, and the good news is you are, taking charge of the future. Uh, you're shaping, leading, and driving change in a way that's moving our state forward. Uh, Vision 2030, which is our plan, you can go ahead and advance that, uh, is really uh, putting the business community in the driver's seat around four key areas, and I apologize, this isn't very easy to read, but there's really four things our leaders have said we have to get right for North Carolina to be the best state for business. We have to invest in education and talent. North Carolina needs to be the best state for talent at all levels, K through 12, community colleges, higher ed. Talent is really the coin of the realm. You think about your businesses. Nothing happens without great people, great talent. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the heart and soul of what you do. North Carolina is the envy of almost every state in America because we have some of the best talent producing uh, activities uh, of any state of our kind. Our community colleges, our university systems, among the best in the country, some even tops in the world. Second thing we have to have is a competitive business climate. Uh, I've lived in states that got the education piece right and forgot the competitive business climate piece. It doesn't work because uh, you know what happens with talent. You know, there's a reason why we're the third largest in, in migration of talent. Talent's leaving those states that haven't figured out how to compete. They're moving here because North Carolina is growing jobs. But all those costs of doing business matter. And, and, the, and the race that we're in is racing those states that are busy making their climate better uh, the good news is, from our standpoint, North Carolina is catching up. Uh, we're engaged and we're paying attention to the issues that matter to business. Uh, the third area that we touched on a little bit is our infrastructure and growth. How do we make sure North Carolina is growth ready? So when those three million people come here, that's the wrong time to figure out what are we going to do. We've got to be ready right now. And again, that, that billion or so dollars of recurring money that we're going to be investing in the future, that's happening right now. That's not like someday. That's happening right now. But, but those are the kind of right policy choices that aren't always politically popular, but it's the right thing to do for North Carolina. And the final area we think we have to get right is we have to be a, a state that's uh, friendly and open for entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, as excited as we are about our current economy, uh, you know what our past economy has looked like. It's evolved to our current economy. What are we doing to get ready for the next economy? So right now in universities all across this, this state, uh, smart folks are busy figuring out, you know, who's the next Facebook, who's the next Google, who's the next SAS, who's the next Cree. Uh, smart ideas are coming out of universities. I, I was just uh, 
had an incubator in Raleigh with a couple of NC State students uh, right out of college. They're, they're, they're figuring out how to create game-changing uh, applications that will disintermediate entire businesses. So smart people are, are right here in North Carolina. Uh, we need to be the place that is attractive and conducive to put smart people and smart ideas to work. We think North Carolina is one of those states. So that, that's kind of the state of North Carolina manufacturing. Uh, obviously, we're very excited about North Carolina present and future. Uh, I think what your leadership team is doing here complements nicely what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we're working with leaders in Raleigh, uh, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, we work with what we call the Business Caucus. We're working with leaders that care about the future. They care about investing in a growing economy. But more importantly, they're, they're making the smart choices around the things that will grow the economy and create opportunity. Because the good news is, when you do that, uh, not only do jobs get created, but we can invest in priorities. We can invest in infrastructure. We can invest in K through 12. We can invest in education. And it has to happen that way. Growth drives economic opportunity. Economic opportunity allows us to invest in our future. And that's what North Carolina is doing right now. Uh, that might not be the way you read it in the newspaper, but from our standpoint, as a group advocating for business day in and day out at the Capitol, uh, we're moving North Carolina forward. Uh, the role you're playing as manufacturers are critical. Uh, I won't kid you, you've lived through a decade or so uh, of business activity that's probably the worst any of us have ever seen. But the good news is North Carolina has come out at the other end of that. Uh, the economy is stronger. Uh, we're putting more people to work. And it's an exciting time to be in our state. Uh, but make no mistake about it, when you, when you read about what's happening in the world and the world economy we're now part of. I read a book recently by Jim Clifton. Uh, Jim is the uh, CEO of Gallup. And the book, if you haven't read it, is called The Coming Jobs War. Uh, but he really kind of makes the point, you know, he says uh, World War II was sort of the war to end all wars. The war, uh, but he, he really says when you look around the world today, there's a billion more people than there are good jobs. So if you ever wonder if the competition for jobs is fierce, uh, and in, in, in his research what he's determined is that's the number one priority of all the folks they interview around the world. They want a good paying job. North Carolina is well positioned to win and lead that jobs war. But make no mistake about it, I mean, other states are on our heels. Uh, other countries want what we have. Uh, but this is a state that's moving forward. We're building on a great legacy of the past. But I can tell you, we're not resting on any laurels, just like you're not. So we're excited to be here. We're excited that uh, you're a part of this effort. Uh, Teresa, congratulations for bringing this group together tonight. Uh, my guess is next year when this group meets, it'll be twice the size. So wish you all the best success for the year to come. Thanks for what you do for North Carolina and for Rocky Mountain. Thank you.